So uh, we have two people on stage who have been working at the intersection of public policy and digital security for a long time. When I was going through your bios, I noticed that you all started working on these issues in Washington at about the time that Steve Jobs was starting up again in Apple for his second tour of duty. So <laughs> you've been at this for quite a while. Uh, to my left is Michael Vadis. Uh, in 1998, correct me if I'm wrong, you became the founding director of the National Infrastructure, Pro Infrastructure Protection Center at the FBI. Uh, in addition, he's been the associate deputy general in the excuse me, Associate Deputy Attorney General in the Department of Justice, where he worked on national security, and Special Counsel at the Department of Defense. He's now a partner at Steptoe & Johnson in New York City. Uh, and I just give you all that detail to, to again, reiterate that you've been working on this uh, in depth for, for quite some time. To Michael's left is Peter Swire. Uh, in 1999, Peter became President Clinton's Chief Counselor for Privacy in the Office of Management and Budget. Uh, he was the only person then and the only person now who's had government-wide responsibility for privacy. Uh, in the administration. More recently in the Obama administration, he was special assistant for the president for economic policy and part of a review group on intelligence and communications after the Snowden disclosures. Uh, he is now a professor of law and ethics at Georgia Tech, as well as special counsel at uh, Alston and Byrd in Atlanta. So thank you both for, for joining me today. Again, my name is Nancy Scola. I'm a tech reporter at Politico. Send your tips and leads to nscola at politico.com. Thank you very much. Okay. So at issue in this case is one iPhone. Uh, it's an iPhone 5C. Uh, but there's been some discussion about what the implications are for this case on digital security more broadly. Um, the very first line of Apple's most recent filing in California is this is not a case about one isolated iPhone. Uh, they go on to say the government says just this once, just this one phone, but the government knows that these statements are not true. That reads the filing. Tim Cook has talked about the software that they've been asked to create as a type of cancer, the software equivalent of cancer. And the government, meanwhile, has said, has offered the, the sort of competing uh, vision of this case and saying, There's, this is just about this one phone. The software never has to come into the government's custody. James Comey, the FBI director, told the House of Representatives, the code the judge has directed Apple to write works only on this one phone. So who is right? And why is this side that is wrong in this case saying what they're saying. Are we supposed to do a poll first? I'm just, was there, do we have organizers? I'm, I'm seeing we are going to do a poll after the introduction on the screen here. <laughs> <laughs> I'm sorry to cut you off, Nancy, but I just. No. Was, I would be very happy right now because it's really, okay, we'd like the audience to get involved. Um, we want to see this. Here we go. Hi, my name's Andy and I work for New America. <laughs> Sorry, Nancy. No, no, please. I'm going to catch you up a little bit. We would like to do polling on this question. This is an important question that has been discussed in the media a lot, and we'd really like the audience to get engaged. So there are clickers, keypads on your, t on your chair or on someone else's chair, and we're going to ask the same question twice. This is the question. The court should require Apple to provide the technical assistance that the government is demanding <coughs> to facilitate access to the San Bernardino's shooter's iLock a locked iPhone. So you can do yes, which will be one, B, uh, which will be two, and C, I don't know, three. We're going to ask this now, and then before audience Q&A, after you've heard these experts debate the issue, we're going to ask the same question again. So we'd really like to see if this debate impacts how the audience and, you know, how our friends on Twitter are thinking about this issue. So if you're on Twitter, tell us what your answer is, and at the end of the debate, we'll tell you what the before answer was and what the after answer was. Excellent, thanks so much. And another uh, logistics note, we're going to uh, speak for some time and then we're gonna put it up for Q&A at the end. Uh, so get your questions ready. So again, do I, should I go through that again? Or the basic question is, is this about one phone or not? And why is the side that is making the wrong argument, in your opinion, making that argument? Anybody go? Peter? Anybody go? Um, oh. Let me jump, jump in. Um, you know, you asked uh, which side is right. Uh, on that question of is this about one phone or, or all iPhones. And I don't think either is right. I think both sides are being uh, a little bit misleading in how they're characterizing the case. Because if you read Apple's public statements and if you read the, the introduction to its brief, you would think that the government is demanding that Apple sell, not just do something with this phone, but actually sell a product that has a built-in weakness, which is not at all what the government's asking it to do. If you read the government's brief, you would think that this case has implications only for one phone, 
and that there are not actually 100 other phones lined up waiting to be unlocked. And so they're, they're both, I think, you know, for strategic reasons, uh, somewhat mischaracterizing what this case is about. So it is about one phone in that the, the order that the government is seeking is for Apple to assist in unlocking that one phone uh, or in putting the government in a, in a position where it can unlock the phone is really what it's about. Um, but if Apple does assist by developing a software tool to enable the FBI to do what it wants to this phone, that tool would potentially be available for other iPhones that have the same operating system, at least. So it, it does have broader implications than just this case. And can, the follow-up question, can, why are the sides making that argument? I mean, it might seem obvious on the surface, but can you parse that a little bit about why it's so critical that they're taking the stand that they're taking? Yeah, App, Apple's characterizing this as, as you know, government OS, like, like you know, Apple's going to be selling a, a new operating system to the public because it wants it wants this case to be seen through the prism of its broader policy objective, which is to oppose any legislation that would require uh, phone manufacturers or other hardware or software manufacturers to embed some sort of backdoor that would allow government access to encrypted uh, data. So it wants, it, it wants this case to be seen as part of, of that whole uh, issue. Um, the government wants to extract this case from that whole set of much more difficult issues and much more contentious issues and portray this as just a routine request for government for, for private sector assistance in effectuating a search warrant. Can I, so I, is, I think on this issue, is it one phone, Apple has the better of it by far. Um, first of all, one phone today on Monday will become a murder case in Atlanta or DC on Tuesday and will become another case on Wednesday. So once Apple has built the variation on the operating system on Monday for this case, on Tuesday when there's a murder case, I don't see how they can say, no, we're not going to help you on this one. We only help you for San Bernardino. We don't help you on the murder case. So there's at least a slippery slope to other unlocking of devices in the same situation. But I, I think beyond that, the, the All Writs Act, which is the law that people are spending the most time arguing about, and this is, on this one I'm with the Wall Street Journal editorial board, which doesn't happen all the time. Um, uh, the Wall, Wall Street Journal editorial board said if the All Writs Act can compel Apple to rewrite the operating system for these devices it has, where does it end? Do other things. And the, the real risk, the big slippery slope problem on encryption becomes much worse if it turns out that the government asks um, Apple to create remote access to iPhones, which then is a vulnerability anywhere in the world. You can attack from anywhere to anywhere. And when it comes to, to breaking encryption, if you're breaking encryption at that wholesale level, that's a critical infrastructure problem of the first magnitude. And nothing in the government's argument shows any difference between this one phone and a assistance that would help us get in remotely in the future. And so until the government or the courts or Congress or somebody sets some line there, we have a huge slippery slope problem. And I think that's why perhaps Apple took the position now on a horrible case, San Bernardino case, because that slippery slope is such a massive problem if we break encryption for remote access. Okay, excellent. So you're both attorneys. Uh, you've both been government attorneys. If you're counsel to the FBI, do you counsel the FBI not to ask for this information even though it might further their investigation because of their concerns about what it means for cybersecurity or digital security in the future? Well, one, one thing that happened here is that it's a, it's a law enforcement case and it's not a, a FISA case. So there could be, I don't, we don't have any reason in the public record to think that the same request had been made of Apple for a foreign intelligence warrant. I'm sorry, translate that I, a little I, I'll bit say, for the- Foreign Intelligence Surveillance Act, the, the, the ability to go after terrorists and spies and agents of foreign powers in the United States. There's the secret FISA court and there's briefing that can happen there, but we wouldn't have this big public debate the same way. And maybe part of why Apple fought this case is that it was a law enforcement case where they could go public about the debates in the criminal domain. Um, and um, it's, it's an interesting choice for the government. You might have thought they would try to get the precedent without all the publicity um, and, and then uh, have shown that there was uh, the ability to already get this cooperation from Apple. But instead we have this highly public version on a criminal case. Um, and uh, I, I think that's, a, that's been a weakness for the government that they're, they're getting beat up in public opinion to some extent 
instead of litigating it in a, in a forum that might have been more favorable for them? You know, I, th I, think, I think their approach is the right one. Um, I think, in general, that, that this is very different from asking companies to build in vulnerabilities into the products that they put on the market. I, there is clearly a slippery slope issue uh, because the All Writs Act, which was written in 1789 and only slightly amended since then, has extremely broad terms that I internally have no limitations. Um, but courts for decades have um, been able to draw lines and say, you know, this is going, this, you're asking this company or this individual to go too far, so I'm not going to grant the order. In other cases, they say, I don't think this is too burdensome, so I'm going to, I'm going to grant the government's request in this case. And I, I think courts are capable of drawing those lines. I mean, Fourth Amendment jurisprudence, the, 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 the law of searches and seizures, consists entirely of courts drawing lines about what constitutes a reasonable search and seizure and what constitutes an unreasonable search and seizure. You know, reasonable or unreasonable, um, that word, it, those words in themselves don't have a lot of meaning until a judge puts meaning in them in, in each particular case. And I think that's really, realistically, that's really the, the only way to deal with these requests for assistance because uh, even Apple, I mean, a lot of Apple's allies may be objecting to the notion of uh, companies having to assist the government at all. But the companies who actually live in the real world know that um, telecommunications companies, equipment manufacturers, landlords, custodians, uh, taxi drivers, all sorts of people have been forced to give government assistance in effectuating search warrants, wiretaps, and it's been going on for decades. Uh, and no one's ever said that's an illegitimate request. So the question in my mind is, what sort of request goes too far? San Bernardino, to me, is, is, is right at the edge, um, possibly over the edge. I'd like to reserve my own personal judgment until I see the government's response to Apple's um, brief. Uh, so I, I, I fall in C, I don't know at, at this point. <laughs> Ask me again next week and I'll have a more definitive view. Okay, uh, so I've asked you to play a government lawyer for FBI. If, let's play Tim Cook, Apple CEO Tim Cook. If you think it's questionable or extremely uh, unpleasant for the government to have asked Apple to essentially be drafted into creating software, should Tim Cook have volunteered? Should Apple have volunteered to avoid this outcome in the courts? If you were Tim Cook, what would you have done if presented with this question? So I think we've seen a huge response since Snowden in 2013 from American tech companies to go very publicly and strongly in the direction of better encryption. There had been lots of people, including myself, beating them up for years saying, you know how to do better encryption and you're not doing it. And um, we, we just issued a report last week that showed the fraction of internet backbone traffic that's encrypted using HTTPS. So in April 2014, that was less than a year after Snowden, the percentage of traffic that was encrypted in the US in the backbone was 13%. And in February, based on the numbers we pulled, that number went up to 49%. So in less than two years, the fraction of encrypted traffic in the US, um, which applies to you for most of the top 50 websites and all that, is now encrypted at a massively greater scale. That's uh, been done by the companies, and Microsoft's done this, Google, you know, Apple, and others. They've done that to show to their customers in the United States and abroad that people can trust them with their data. They were very upset with some of the revelations that came out from under Snowden, Microsoft's general counsel called the US government an advanced persistent threat. Um, uh, and, um, and so we've seen a big shift by the companies who in order to have customer uh, trust have felt they have to push very, very strongly in this direction and now this is the visible moment when the real fight happens about that. I thought it was interesting that um, Bill Gates was asked essentially that question uh, by the Financial Times and was reported to have said that he thought Apple should have just gone along with the request. And then the next day he <laughs> issued some sort of clarification which to me just made it clear that Tim Cook called him up and said, "What?" What are you saying? <laughs> You're completely <laughs> pulling the rug out from under me. Um, yeah, that would have been a nice call to have been on. Um, so, you know, I, I think despite the tremendous outpouring of briefs on, on Apple's side in this case, I think within clo behind closed doors within industry, I think views are, are actually somewhat more mixed on this. Um, the other interesting thing is that while San Bernardino is going on, 
there's a parallel case going on in Brooklyn involving uh, an older uh, operating system, which Apple can, can easily unlock and extract data for the government and has done so approximately 84 times already. Um, it's been reported 70, but in fact, more recent information shows it's more like 83 or 84. Uh, and Apple was all set to comply with the judge's order to extract the data in the Brooklyn case until the magistrate there said, hang on a second, I'm not so sure the All Writs Act actually allows the government to do this. Um, Apple, you know, I'd like a brief from you. And it was at that moment in October that Apple decided to object, even in that case. Um, I, I don't have any problem with the government's position in that case because Apple's not being asked to write uh, new software. It, it has already extracted data in similar cases. It has the tool on the shelf. I think that's a much easier case for the government, but it's interesting that Apple decided ultimately to object even in that case um, and didn't just wait for San Bernardino. Okay. Um, one of the things that's been interesting in, in sort of the reporting out of this uh, situation, and there have been some great reporters covering the ins and outs of this, is that there's some difference of opinion inside the administration. Secretary of Defense Ashton Carter has come out and been vocally pro-encryption, pro-strong encryption, however you want to define it in this case, essentially saying that the FBI has gone too far. James Comey obviously has been very aggressive asking for access to this particular phone. The, one of the things that was interesting when we were prepping for this, uh, we talked about the history, the, these fights have been going on for decades, and Michael, you said it's deja vu every day. We've had some of these discussions over and over again. How well has the administration however you want to define that sort of, every branch of the administration up to the president um, responded in this situation, given that we've been doing this for 40 years. So if you can grade the administration on how well they've handled this situation, what would that be? And I'm looking for a letter grade. <laughs> <laughs> You're the professor, you go Well, I, I'd say it's incomplete. I mean, uh, <laughs> <laughs> that's good. <laughs> uh, you know, it's a group project, but the group uh, um, team members <laughs> haven't all agreed yet. Um, yeah. that I, I, if I can slightly turn, I mean, so in the 90s, and, and Michael was living through some of these, and I was living through other meetings, the rough lineup was the NSA and the FBI wanted the most access to data. They're, they're doing intelligence and laws. And roughly, commerce is the one that's been most favor, favorable to the industry. We need strong encryption argument. And the, the most interesting swing vote, in some ways, has been the Defense Department. Because in the 90s, they're tempted, NSA is part of the Defense Department, they're, they were tempted for a long time to think that being strong meant national security, we have to do our intelligence. And at some point during the 90s, the voices in the Pentagon started to say, wait a second, we need to have strong encryption built in the United States, and we don't want our Navy and Air Force encryption to be weak and broken by other people, so we need really, really good encryption for defense. And so in the bureaucratic battles in the 90, eventually around 99, the Defense Department shifted to the Commerce Department side. Um, and when that happened, um, that's when it, it changed and the administration ended up saying, okay, we need to have strong encryption. So seeing the Secretary of Defense come out again this time, voicing the need for effective encryption, uh, I think reminds us that there's, there's really compelling equities within the government on both sides. And if you think of running a military operation, you sure want to have effective encryption. And that might have been what we were hearing from Secretary of Defense Carter to some extent. There really are remarkable parallels between the, the internal debate in the administration now and what was happening in the, in the mid-90s when I was working on this issue. I was one of the DOJ people trying to advance the law enforcement interest, which was not, you know, um, weak in encryption, but it was, you know, let's find out, let's find some way to allow law enforcement access and national security access to encrypted data so that we, we're not flying blind when we're trying to catch terrorists and, and spies and, and serious criminals. Um, and we were, you know, lockstep with the NSA, which was the, which, you know, had an interest in being able to decode the communications of people abroad that it was monitoring. But I remember vividly being the day in the White House when we were having yet another meeting uh, on this issue to come up with an administration policy when all of a sudden NSA, um, you know, if, if the representative didn't physically get up and move away from me, he did so in spirit because they just, they changed their mind. And it be became clear to me, okay, I guess this is no longer a problem for NSA because they figured out another way to deal with it. Um. Um, and that's the thing, there, you know, 
the intelligence interests and the law, form, law enforcement interests are not coextensive because NSA is always going to be able to find ways around encryption. They'll, they'll, they'll get the communication before it's encrypted, after it's decrypted, or somehow put some vulnerability in that will, that will allow them to get access. It is a much harder thing for law enforcement to do, which is constrained by the law, has much fewer uh, resources uh, to be able to brute force, uh, break encryption, and things like that. So um, I remember feeling very much like we were left holding the bag. I mean, we, we had been advancing the argument for uh, the whole national security community, and suddenly we're, we're there left alone, which is in large part, I think, why uh, the commerce view ended up prevailing. Um, because law enforcement was on its own at that point. Okay, one of you talked about having to inform Attorney General <laughs> Janet Reno that she was not going to win. Yeah, I was, I was a relatively, I was a sort of medium level official reporting to people who went to what are called deputies meetings in Washington. And we had a meeting in the Situation Room where Justice was coming over to hear the update. Um, and so I did the Washington thing of, as the junior person sitting in the back of the room like you do and then you let the senior people, they said, no Peter, you sit up here. <laughs> and the deputy sat behind me, and I got to tell Janet <laughs> Reno that the administration decided she was going to lose on all this. Uh, and she, she's, a, she's a large woman. She's very, she has strong views and powerful presence. And I remember just sort of sitting there as she got really, really mad because she had not been briefed that this was going to happen at that meeting. Um, the deputies who had been with her in the room for years didn't want to didn't want to tell her that. Um, <laughs> it, it, it was, it, yeah. Um, so I. I think one of the things that's hard to tell from the Defense Department is how much the NSA got capabilities and how much the other interests in the Defense Department to have effective encryption built in the United States weighed in. And I, I, I think it's hard to tell. I think both of those were going on to some extent. And, and after the Snowden papers, there was a lot written about capabilities the NSA had, to, not so much to rig the standards, which was talked about a lot, but that they had a lot of different ways in using their best resources. So it does seem like they had ways in over for years. By contrast, the local police department has no way in. And there's thousands of local jurisdictions. And if you were the officer on an important case in your small town, you have no idea how to get into this phone. And that's where a lot of the, the anger is coming, I think, right now, is from local law enforcement who really feel shut out from, from things. Hmm. Michael, I let you off the hook. What letter grade? Uh, <laughs> I, you know, compared to the Clinton administration, um, I think they're, they're a B plus uh, because, you know, you're going to have different views and you're never going to be able to um, keep one agency from speaking to the press or going up on the Hill and, and speaking to members of Congress about what, you know, they see as, as their interests or, or the nation's interests from their perspective. Uh, but I think the administration, by and large, done a pretty good job of keeping a relatively united front. I mean, I think they've, they've made it clear they're not seeking legislation uh, to uh, restrict strong encryption or to, you know, require uh, access of some sort. They've made that perfectly clear. On the other hand, they support the FBI in the San Bernardino case. People may disagree with, with that, but I think there's a, there's a reasoned distinction between the two issues. Um, so I, I think they've done a pretty good job of this. Okay. Quick fire question, if you could keep the answer short. <laughs> it, have we reached a level... Um, where have we reached a point in this debate where the president, whoever the president happens to be, needs to weigh in? This has always been sort of agency department infighting internal debate. Is it time for the president of the United States to weigh in? I don't, I don't think there's been clear reporting of exactly what the president has said, but I have every reason to think that the no legislation position is something the president knows about and has approved. Um, and that's, a, that's not what probably FBI Director Comey would have wanted. So to that extent, you know, a forceful presentation from DOJ or FBI has not led to proposed legislation. I think that's a statement very likely of where the president is. Okay. So he has weighed in. We just haven't necessarily been paying attention. He, he hasn't given a speech. The but public I, statements I, I have been sort clear. of vague, but I think he clearly has been part of it. Okay. Yeah, I, I agree. Uh, there has been a I'm just, just going to check the time very quickly. Um, there has been a proposal. So we're going to open up the questions uh, in a few minutes, if you all can think about them. Um, there has been a proposal floating around Capitol Hill, advanced by Senator Mark Warner of Virginia, 
uh, Rep. Michael McCall of Texas to create a digital security commission, bringing together industry, academics, government, law enforcement to come to some sort of solution. It's modeled after the 9-11 uh, commission. And they claim that they're getting some traction within tech companies, within te the tech industry, because they want some solution that isn't sort of mandated by the courts. Uh, some other folks in sort of digital civil society worlds have pushed back against that. They think it's just the sort of the next step towards legislation. Do you think that sort of commission, let's get everyone around the table, is a good idea or not? To, to quote Animal House, knowledge is good. You know, and, and to, the, to, to the extent a commission will, will foster more knowledge about the issues and the competing equities and all that, that's great. But it, it's hardly a solution. Um, and it's a typical Washington solution to a problem. We can't figure it out. Let's appoint a commission and, and claim that we did our, you know, we answered the, the bell and that's it. So, you know, great, but it's really not helpful. I, I, Apple has, has Apple wants to be for something, and so they're for the commission. New America, our host today, I think has expressed its concerns about the commission as leading to more problems than good. Um, I like Apple, I like New America. Um, <laughs> they disagree on that. Um, w one thing that, that has, and maybe Michael feels it, one thing we have seen is there was a huge education project on encryption in the late 90s. Every member of Congress went through multiple meetings to learn about the issue. And to some extent, we're having to retrain everybody again on these issues. And whether it's a commission or something else, getting to the point where people understand the technology, the, the trade implications, and the rest, there's, there's something good that comes from that because you realize some things simply aren't possible. There's a lot of people who magically want things to be possible, like having a key that only works for the good guys and not the bad guys. And, th and that key doesn't work. We have not been able to do magic on that. And it takes a while to come to the view that that's actually the truth. So education at some level is essential. Um, and whether it's a commission or something else, people are going to have to go through that process, I think. Okay. Is there a last question for me, and then we'll open it up? Uh, is there anything that you knew to be on the phone in the San Bernardino case that would tip the scales towards the FBI in your mind? That you would say, OK, Apple needs to step up and open up and help make it possible to open up this phone? The sort of ticking time bomb scenario, the, is there anything on that phone that you would think would make it, would you compel you to change your mind on this? Well, since I haven't made up my mind yet, um, <laughs> it, would, it would certainly, if there were a ticking time bomb, if, if, if we knew that there was a, a high likelihood that there was information about additional plots that the shooter had been in communication with other uh, terrorists about, um, that would certainly, uh, I think, matter. It, it would enter the calculus of determining whether the request was reasonable or not. My, my answer is, is it's like the ticking time bomb and torture question, right? If you knew the bomb was going to go off, do you torture the person? And would you change U.S. policy to allow torture? And everyone in the room has been around that conversation, and the law, rule of law people say, no, you just don't, you don't go against the law. So I'll stick with the no torture and no breaking of encryption position. Okay, excellent. Uh, questions, do we, are we doing a microphone? Who's in charge here? Okay. Kevin, we'll give you. Here's one. Hi, Kevin Bankston, OTI. Just one quick clarification. New America's OTI program has taken a position regarding the commission. The greater New America organization has not. Um, question, what do you guys make of the Apple side's argument that compelling Apple to code this new program uh, and or to sign it with its own encryption, with its own signing key and legitimize it so that the phone accepts it. What do you make of that First Amendment argument? I can try here, dude. Um, you know, I don't personally think much of it. Uh, I don't think Apple thinks much of it because it got less than a page in its brief, I think. Um, and, you know, it's, it's a nice argument. There have been some cases suggesting that that code is speech, uh, but the the implications of that argument, talk about a slippery slope. Um, you know, if code is speech, then, then the idea of government regulation of anything involving software it goes by the boards unless there's a compelling state interest. Uh, and there are lots of other things under that argument that become speech. I mean, industrial design. Why is the design of a car not speech? Does, does Honda or Ford have a right to design a car without seatbelts and airbags because they believe in human freedom? Uh, you know, unconstrained by government uh, notions of, of preserving public safety. 
I mean, where, where does that end? So, I, you know, I don't, think, I don't think Apple takes it seriously, and, and I think the argument's got a lot of problems. Did you want to take that? Okay. Uh, yeah, right. Yeah, they're coming with the mic. Hi, I'm Allison Stanger. I'm a fellow of the New America Cybersecurity Initiative and also a professor of political science at Middlebury College in Vermont. And I just wanted to f ask uh, Michael to elaborate on his position of answering C in that questionnaire. What would you need to know or see in the government response to tick A or to tick B? If you could sketch that out for us, I think it'd be interesting. Well, you know, I, given my view, I, I, think, I think these questions of what, what can courts order under the All Writs Act become very fact dependent. And so uh, I'd like to know more facts. One thing I think would be interesting would be to know how does the, the burden that Apple says this case would impose on them? Uh, that is, you know, it would take six to 10 people, two to four weeks of, of time working on this. How does that compare to a typical wiretap uh, order or typical, you know, assistance in a search warrant case uh, where Telecommunications companies all the time respond. Do, you know, often those things take a lot of work. Uh, and you know, Apple talked about having, you know, the government's asking us to set up a, a hacking department. Well, a lot of these companies have huge infrastructures uh, for assisting the government in, in these types of cases. So you know, creating, devoting six engineers for a couple of weeks to a problem you know, might not be that different from what is done all the time. So the government might, might have something to say about that. Uh, and also effectuating wiretap or orders uh, may well, I believe do, require companies to write software to uh, enable them to focus on the communication, the target communications, filter out other communications, uh, and deliver it to the government. You know, is that, so is this case as qualitatively different as Apple's characterizing it, I don't. You know, those are facts that I'd like. I'd be interested in if I were the judge. Wow, encryption and no hints. The second one. Thank you. I'm Adam Eisgrau with the American Library Association. Um, Mr. Sensenbrenner quite conspicuously uh, and insistently uh, asked Apple's general counsel testifying the other day, uh, what proposals, legislative proposals, would Apple put forward to govern what Apple could or should do in these circumstances? My question to the panelists is, was that a fair question? I, I already said that Apple wanted to be for something. They're for a commission. That's a lot safer for them than saying, here's the way to regulate us. That's not what companies typically like proposing. Um, they usually wait for someone to come by and then explain why it's a terrible idea. That's usually the way regulation conversation works in Washington. Um, you know, there, there, there are different kinds, there are ways you can move on. on uh, so there's, there could be pro-encryption laws. California has a proposal that would ban sale of smartphones unless you could open them up in a court order. There's a proposal in the California legislature. People have been floating language in Washington saying, let's preempt that, not let states go and force the breaking of encryption. So from the, we think encryption is important for safety side, there are proposals that could lock in that view st more strongly. Th that's not where Sensenbrenner was heading, but I think it's where a lot of the folks from the encryption side would like to go, because otherwise you could have pernicious proposals popping up all over the place that would break strong encryption. You know, what, this reminds me of something I think that, that needs to be remembered. Um, we talk about this issue as though America setting policy for the world. Uh, one of the things I do in private practice is advise uh, manufacturers of software and hardware, including encryption, on the encryption laws around the world. Um, and we, we have this database of 133 reports on, on countries' laws. Uh, and there are a lot of countries that already restrict the use and importation of encryption uh, unless it meets certain requirements, such as depositing a key, copy of the key, with the government or giving the government access to the software so they can figure out how to break it before it gets sold in their country. The French National Assembly yesterday just passed a bill that would impose strict penalties, including imprisonment, uh, on individuals at companies who refuse to assist in, in breaking encryption. So uh, whatever we do here, 
there are countries in the world who are, are, are already imposing restrictions. Um, and we haven't heard a lot about what Apple or other manufacturers are doing to comply or not comply with those existing laws in other countries. And you know, I think that would be an interesting thing to look into. But one of, the, one of the reasons to fight hard on this issue in the United States is to send a message to the world that effective encryption is important and promotes cybersecurity and allows political dissent. If the United States sends a message instead that we're going to open up security on the name, in the name of uh, surveillance, that's a message for authoritarian regimes, et cetera, to open up on the side of surveillance. So I think it hurts our human rights posture in the world, among other problems. Amy Stepanovich spoke earlier today about some of this. We're sending signals about whether we're on the side of enabling the strong security or enabling surveillance. And I think, I think that's a big signal that will affect the way the rest of the world goes. It, it, it will have that effect, but I guess my point is authoritarian regimes don't need to wait for us to give them permission to be authoritarian and, and to limit encryption. They're already doing it. One uh, last question, then I think we need to throw, we have two minutes left, and we'll throw the poll back up. Um, one last question. How comfortable, say the outcome of this case is that we remain with this status quo, Apple is able to keep up the strong encryption, law enforcement has to look elsewhere. How comfortable are you with the idea that some parts of American life are going to be off limits to law enforcement? I'm super comfortable. I've written <laughs> a, a bunch about how the, the, the image from the law enforcement side is going dark, that suddenly they can't see anything. And I've written about why and said it's the golden age of surveillance. When you look at tracking devices like cell phones, when you look at all the metadata about who we co-conspire with, when you look at all the other databases, I think law enforcement has an unbelievable treasure trove in this era. And if there's certain areas we're able to lock down, law enforcement has really dramatically more resources than it's had before to, to track individuals. So I'm, I'm fine with locking down this part of the system. There will be a cost. Um, you know, and I think that's something that, that we as a society need to recognize and not, and not just assume that this is something that's cost free. Uh, but you know, a lot of we, that's the job of the legislature is to make choices like that. So if Congress wants to impose restrictions on encryption in order to avoid those costs, that's, that's what we pay them the big money for. <laughs> um, not that big. Or, or <laughs> not. <laughs> okay, excellent, thank you so much. So are we, who's our poll master here? Can we start oh. clicking again? How does it work? People still have their clickers on this? Oh, okay, so the poll's back up. So we can go ahead and click. And then Andy is, oh, here she is. You got it? Okay. I can't wait to see the results. <laughs> I think at the RSA conference last week, 86% of people voted no to a pretty similar question. <laughs> So we'll see Representative this, how this crowd of US society. Yeah, yeah, we'll see how that turns out. So yeah, so I think you guys know how to do this, but you've got the clickers the on the The 14% were, were the representatives from government who <laughs> attended. Voted twice. Excellent. So we'll wait here and give it a, give it a second until we get the results back. But um, I want to say thank you to you guys while I have the stage, um, and you guys are captive audience, but uh, thanks very much. It was fascinating and, and I think well, very well thought out conversation. So appreciate it. Okay. And um, yeah. 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 Yeah.